Thank you. I'm not actually the CTO of the Catapult anymore. I've given that on to somebody else now because we decided we got big enough that it needed a full-time job and I wasn't that person. So what Steve... Well, I can't remember if Steve asked me to talk about this or I said I'd talk about this, but this is thoughts on the future of UK manufacturing. It doesn't really just need to be UK. It's thoughts on manufacturing in general. Um, and I thought I'd tell you a bit about me because you can, you'll see where some of the ideas and the thoughts have come from and then a bit about background. And then there are four or five things we're going to talk about. There's the development of manufacturing capacity, because the way that demand and supply grow has a huge impact on what happens and what happens next. And we'll look at that. Then we'll look at resource efficiency as an issue, personalization and customization, a connected world, natural systems, and then what future manufacturing needs to be like as a consequence. So these are my thoughts, rather than anybody else's. I was, I'm a metallurgist by academic training, and I worked for Rolls-Royce in my early days, and I, I made single crystal turbine blades. I made their first single crystal turbine blades, and I did my PhD on them as well. And then I worked for ICI, a company that doesn't exist anymore. But I worked on polymer film manufacturing, and I ran an 11,500 tonne a year recovery plant that took scrap polymer film, turned it back into polymer, and made it back into film again. And that was the best way for us to make loads of money. And if we couldn't make it into films anymore, we sold it to people that made it into fibres. So it was a closed loop. And it, but it was a controlled closed loop. We, we could see what was happening. We then went on to advanced polymers, where I did business development in France and Scandinavia for high temperature polymers. That's not very high temperature, really. It's like two, 300 centigrade. And I finished my time at ICI as petrochemicals, plastics, and fertilizers board director, looking after the whole of that integrated system, which went from oil through to products. That company doesn't exist anymore, but nearly all of those assets still operate, owned by another company, and they're still in the UK, but none of those companies are British. I then went and worked for British Steel as their business development director for what was then called Sections, Plates and Commercial Steels, which tells you what they made, but isn't the snappiest title in the universe. Uh, and then when Chorus was formed, I was the construction director. Again, neither of those companies exist, but the assets are still being run by somebody. Um, I started the Centre for Process Innovation 10 years ago, and what we do is we help companies scale their next generation processes and get them ready for market. So we have about 280 people, we have about 100 million pounds worth of assets, and people come to us with an idea, usually that works in a teacup scale or something like that, and if it's in formulation, industrial biotechnology, printed electronics, or biological pharmaceuticals, then we will help them scale up their process. Um, we did allude to the fact that I was CTO of the Catapult as well. So when the high value manufacturing Catapult was formed, it needed somebody that could understand what everybody in the Catapult did to help them unite, I suppose. And I did that role for the last three, four years. So that's me. And you will see that some of that leads through into the things I think about and the way I think about them. So Innovate, Innovate UK currently have five strategic manufacturing themes, which are supposedly the ones that are guiding where we're going. IFM did this work for Innovate UK, although it was called the Technology Strategy Board then. And those five themes are resource efficiency, manufacturing systems, you can read what the, the bit underneath says, the integration of materials, the manufacturing processes, and business models. And they underpin what Innovate UK try to do with their manufacturing landscape and their strategy and their cause that they fund in the UK. And they're all really about resource efficiency or industrial sustainability. And if you go down those routes and you start to deliver processes and products in that way, then you become significantly more efficient. But there's a history. And this is the beginning of that history. So this is Western European steel consumption since 1950. That's the red line. Those blue dots are the actual production by year. Along the bottom, we've got wealth measured as GDP per person in, con in constant money. Now, you will see that when recessions happen, consumption falls, and it actually wealth got, falls backwards as well. And up the side, over the, on the far side, we've got consumption, and we've done it by person on this particular graph to give you a, a clue as to how it works. Um, economy of scale... As, grow, as, as consumption grows quite rapidly, it becomes a big deal. So people want something, and you just build more and more capacity to make it for them. Once they've made it, once they've got, everybody's got as much as they need, they don't need it quite so much, and they want something that's different from what everybody else has got. And that's where this personalization and customization idea happens. But often at that point, process reinvention occurs as well, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So that's just a fitted curve through the data from 1950. 
It's a six-point polynomial for what it's worth. It isn't, hasn't actually got any scientific underpinning other than the fact it mathematically fits the data. And the other thing you notice from this is that the data points nearest to me show how deep the recession we've just been through was because that's the worst recession we've had in the last 75 years. But my, many industries follow a curve like this, and I'll show you another one in a second. The thing that's tended to drive manufacturing once you get into this massive growth phase is that once you get into maturity, you go for economy of scale. And you believe, as you go for economy of scale, that capital per unit gives you more consistent quality. Well, it does. It makes average quality. It doesn't make anything that's great. It's just consistent. And you also get, get under the... Uh, the illusion that larger production capacity gives higher profit because operating costs are lower. And generally speaking, that isn't true when you get into the process reinvention bit. But while the market's growing really quickly, that's great. So it's quite attractive just to build bigger and bigger things. But once maturity's gone, you can't build another great big plant because your demand's not growing. So you build it in another country that is growing, China often at the moment, uh, and then you, you, you bring stuff back. But once you've got to this flat bit at the top of the curve, the capacity is built on the basis of economy of scale struggles to demand what you want. So a Toyota factory, for instance, built to make loads of cars, makes them all the same to start with. But now we want cars that have different colored roofs or different wheels or different, loads of different things built into them. So there's a huge amount of effort put into making the plant more flexible so that it can give you what you want, so that it's different from next door's car. The problem with a big economy of scale plant that cannot reach that flexible point is that it becomes, it, it goes under, it gets under pressure so that its profits fall after a while and it goes into cost reduction strategies and eventually at the end of about 30 or 40 years it comes to the end of its life and it closes. So the point from this discussion is that the growth in customization and personalization combined with lower economic growth or flat consumption growth contributes to a drive for innovation. In the steel industry, the big thing that happened was the advent of the mini-mill. Now, the mini-mill came from a company called Nucor, who were a not very good builder of nuclear power stations, but happened to have a good way of making steel using scrap. And when they started using that plant, they completely changed the complexion of the steel industry. So locally arising scrap was used to supply a local market instead of getting iron ore and coal from the opposite side of the world and bringing it in. So it's a more sustainable system. The capital that you need to invest in order of magnitude lower, so your return comes much earlier, so you don't have to have something that's got to work for 20 or 30 years before you get your money back. You can do it in five or ten. Logistics costs are much lower because you're supplying a local market. Your batch is much smaller, so you can be more flexible in terms of what you're making. You can afford to build it. You can make product from scrap material that's exactly the same as something you've made from virgin iron ore and coal and and that's particularly true of beams and rods and bars. The steel, the mini mill, in inverted commas, because they're not that mini, they're like 500,000 tonnes to a million tonnes, as, as, as opposed to 5 million tonnes, which is a normal steelworks size, is now 30% of steel production in the world. So that's 400 million tonnes a year, maybe a bit more now, probably nearer 500 million tonnes a year, is produced that route. And it was changed by this small upstart company. The incumbents couldn't respond, and, it's, and they've been un, in, under quite significant pressure over a long period of time to make those changes that have allowed them to compete. But the overall system cost of producing steel using a mini mill is lower than it is using the conventional system. And that kind of approach, those kind of theories of local, local, lower capital, faster return, are the kinds of things that drive other industries to innovate as well. So you can split it into four or five different blocks, and we'll come back to them, because this maturity and, and, the, and the like is, is quite important. Because when you originally start with an industry, you're right over at the far left-hand side there, and it's a craft industry. People do it in their back gardens or their houses. As demand grows, consumption needs to follow that, and people build bigger and bigger plants, so you get this rapid growth phase. When you get into the maturity phase, the growth stops and you need to start worrying about doing something else. You become post-mature. And that takes you into a world of making different things in different ways, which we'll come to in a second. Before we do go on, though, there are only really four ways of making a process better. You can improve the existing steps you've got, so just become more efficient. You, you can make your value chain perform better with the existing assets. You can replace the rubbish steps of the asset to make the whole value chain more efficient, 
which is another quite common thing, but changes processes in those steps that just de-bottleneck systems, really, which is the first thing for you to do. But the two that are important to the future of manufacturing are the ones that radically change the process to eliminate the step. So you take process steps out, so you go from a batch process to a continuous process, or you make the existing process product in a more sustainable way. So you go from a fossil feedstock to a biological feedstock or a waste feedstock, or you have processes that completely change the way things are made. So printable electronics or a product we use, which, use, which uses light to treat diseases instead of injections. And the final one is that you can change the business model so that you can deliver the thing into market in a different way. And we've talked about this. Serviceization is one of those things. Aero engines, it's done with. Photocopiers are brilliant. One of the, some of the best examples of circular economy are in the photocopier world where Xerox and Rico have complete control of the system so they can take all the bits back, fill them up again, send them out again, and they're, and they're covered. And the other thing is you change the game. So the advent of things like the internet has changed the way we do things and the smartphone has changed the way we do things as well. So they're massively, rapidly growing markets that have caused change in other markets. Again, most systems and communities and products work in this way. So let's start looking at the factors that we think are going to have a difference. So we've been through this a few times this week or these last couple of days, that resources go to raw materials, go to manufacturing, go to something in use, and then in a linear system you chuck them away. The first thing that starts to help you is if you reuse that thing, that reduces what you chuck away, it reduces what you have to manufacture, it reduces the raw materials, and it reduces the amount of resource you use. And we do that by flogging things on eBay, by sending our car back when we take a new car, and by using the components and taking things apart. We can take things apart and remanufacture them. Again, that reduces what goes to landfill, and it reduces raw materials, and it reduces resource, but it doesn't reduce the actual manufacturing activity. Recycling is the next one where you take the thing back to the raw material, so you go back to steel, say. And, and again, that reduces what you're chucking away, and it also reduces resource use. So you're starting to close up these loops, and that reduces what you're digging out of the ground, and it reduces what you're throwing away. But what's the best response here? And the economics of how you go about doing these things and what logistically is feasible are the things that you need to, to work out. So steel gets re recycled over and over again, but it does use a lot of energy, but it is relatively easy to collect. If you can get something to last longer in use, that's another way that reduces resource use. But it doesn't go down very well with the government who want the economy to grow by you buying more and more stuff. Reusing stuff is another way of doing it. And remanufacturing is as well. And then the other one, the additive manufacture type thing, is making something that's near the right shape in the first place so you don't throw away a lot of what you manufacture. So people that make aeroplane engines, for instance, weigh it, more than 75% of the material they buy doesn't ever end up in the engine. It goes back through the system somewhere. If you can make the bits to the exact right shape in the first place, that bit's eliminated and you, use, you reduce the amount of resource you use. So it's difficult to know what the best response to resource efficiency is. It depends on economics. It depends on what the social environment, us, is going to accept. And it depends on the manufacturing process. And if we're really going to get into a resource efficient world, our manufacturing systems are going to have to be able to sense and measure what's happened to those components in life so that you can get them back and you can reuse them. We'll come back to that again. So remember my graph about steel on the far side there. Breweries are quite similar, closer to, heart, to our hearts, I understand that. And that data there is breweries from 1950 to, uh, to 2013. And this development of personalization and customization, having something that's different from what everybody else has got, is quite a big trend. So if we look at breweries from 1900 to now, we've got two lines on here. The, uh, the red line is the average size of brewery that was built. So they were all tiny little things in the 1900s. By the time we got to the 1980s, they were the size of big chemical factories. In fact, when I ran an aromatics plant on Teesside, my benchmark plant was the Whitbread Brewery at Maygill, which still makes Stella and Budweiser for you. You'd be very pleased to hear. <clears throat> but the average size of those things has been collapsing since 1980. And the blue line is the number of breweries that have been built. So economy of scale, bigger and bigger breweries, can't make very many things. They have to market like heck to get you to buy it because it's all the same as everybody else. But you get to the point where you don't want that anymore. You want something different. And that's the, the, the rise of the smaller, more craft-based brewer that makes special brews for you. 
and that blue line there, you can see that the average size of brewery in the UK is falling very rapidly, but the number of breweries that are opening is rising. And this is a good example of distributed manufacturing. So people are manufacturing closer to point of use because you want something that's different from other things. Some of the medium-sized breweries are also using technologies like reverse osmosis to turn around their water into different kinds of water. So that's one of the personalization things. Another one's batch to continuous processes. This is a little batch uh, continuous reactor there. It's made by Corning. You take out inventory, you take out stuff, you can change quite quickly from one thing to another. These reactors can take out 50% of your capital, increase your efficiency 60%, and reduce your emissions 60%. The technology is not difficult, but the adoption of it is very difficult. Pharmaceuticals is a classic example here where current processes are commoditized, and what's actually required is things that are more relevant to you as an individual. So next generation costs have to come down, but quality has to go up, and things have to be more customized and personalized. So they're about lower volumes and more flexible manufacturing because diagnostics allow you to decide exactly what medicine you need to have delivered to you. So an integrated approach from discovery through integration into market is quite important. And these little things that look like printers and photocopies are on the, at the bottom here. In the biological pharmaceutical world, where a big molecule treats a specific disease in a specific way and is tailored to you as an individual, they will be made in this kind, perhaps not like that, because that's a bit too simplistic, but it's a thought piece thing that allows you to see that you're changing the way you make things. Rather than just making huge volumes of them, having complicated supply chains, you, di you, you diagnose what's up with somebody and you make exactly what's required for them. But for those kinds of things to work, sensing and measuring becomes important. It has to be either integrated into a product or it has to be worked on you, so it can work on you to work out what the issues are. And that means that things need to know their own history. In, in the words of the catapult, they need to be wise components. They need to know where they were manufactured, how they got where they were, how many times they've been reused, what's happened to them in their life while they've been used, because you've got to recertify the thing before you send it out. And the, you can only work in a completely non-controlled system if you know that kind of stuff. Systems need to be able to integrate together as well. So if I'm right about personalization, customization, and I'm right about brewing, following model following into other industries so that manufacturing becomes much more distributed, those plants need to be able to talk to one another. So some days they all make the same thing, and some days they all make different things. If you go down that route and you can do all of these things, then it enables you to be significantly more resource efficient. It enables you to meet this personalization and customization issue. But you have to be able to establish what system is the best one to work, how it's going to work, and how it's going to be able to bring social benefit. Very, very nearly finished. You'll be pleased to hear. In natural systems, you're trying to look at things that mimic um, the natural world more effectively. Now, this is an AD little thing that was done for the House of Lords Science and Select, Science Select Committee report into the bioeconomy. And they said there are loads of different feedstocks and processes and products that can be made using bio roots. And this kind of summarizes what all of those are. Now, the majority of those processes don't really exist at the moment, but they do need to be flexible and they do need to be distributed. And you have to aspire to develop those processes that are going to mimic the natural world if you want to do it. Because a lot of these biological processes are slow, low concentration and happen at ambient temperature. And the only way it's going to work is if you can integrate bio stuff and fossil stuff together. And that means you've got to look at your problems differently. You've got to ensure that your policymakers and your leaders and your engineers understand the changes needed and that the change is possible. They've got to want to make it and work together in a collaborative way to make it happen. You've also got to be able to have a legislative and regulatory environment that allows you to do it. If you're making a pharmaceutical at point of use, you have to be able to be sure that that is, meets the standard that you would expect in a large current existing plant. So there's loads of opportunity here, but you've got to change the way you think and you've got to change the way that the partnerships work to deliver it. So I think that the future manufacturing drivers are going to be about more use of bio and waste and natural products as feedstocks. You've got to be able to satisfy this need for personalized and distributed markets when you're a developed economy like the UK is. You've got to be able to deal with the fact that demand isn't rising very quickly, and that means your capital's got to be lower, your product yields have got to be higher, but your processes have to be more flexible, which is pretty challenging. That, that 
that, you, that leads you towards smaller plants, but they have to be integrated into networks that all link together. And you have to know what's happened to the product during its manufacturing, in its use, and at the end of its life. And is my way of saying that this is a big data world. So we could do all of these things. We've talked about all of those things. But it's as much a social challenge as a technical one. We can solve nearly all the technical issues, but the, the way we adopt and the way we go about doing it is quite important. And my last slide and my final thoughts are that we're going to be ending up in a more resource-efficient world where we're making more things that are near net shape. We're going to be leasing things, reusing things, looking at things that have got longer life in use, more remanufacturing, all of that kind of stuff. We're going to be being more personalized and customized right across the board. Flexible large plants, so changing the way your car factory works, but also replacing a lot of big plants with small plants that make things at point of use and change the logistics system that we're going to be in a much more connected world where sensing and measuring is provided to integrate with manufacturing and use and recovery, and your networks of manufacturing is going to be linked together in certain systems. And I also think that they're going to be much closer to biological systems in 20 years' time than they are now. Most of these things will happen. Whether it completely consumes all the manufacturing remains to be seen. But the UK needs to make sure that it's involved because we do an awful lot of really excellent research work in this area and we're still not very good at actually implementing it and making sure that we get the benefit from it as a nation. And those are my final thoughts for you. So I hopefully that's been reasonably interesting and there's a slightly different perspective on the way these things are delivered. But those are the kinds of things I spend my daily life working on. Take some questions if you've got any.